he will talk to us about uh, kind of, not surprisingly, uh, category theory applied to causality in particular to these super maps. So Matt, if you can share your screen. Sure. Just send it to full screen. Cool. Go ahead. Great, thanks. So yeah, cheers for the introduction. Um, and thanks very much to QPL for putting this on. It's been really fun so far. And um, yeah, so this is a joint work between myself and one of my supervisors, Judo Kiribana. Um, and the goal of the talk uh, is in two parts. So we want to introduce what we claim are going to be some kind of abstract notions for what higher order physical theories are. And once we've given those, we want to explore the consequences of importing some pretty basic physics inspired principles into these higher order theories. So the kinds of principles we're going to be looking at are things like the consequences of our theories being deterministic and the consequences of some very, very kind of <laughs> some very primitive restrictions on on the kinds of spatial correlations we have. So we say we're going to start off by giving an abstract notion of a higher order physical theory before talking about a higher order theory is. We should say how we're going to be modeling physical theories in general. So we're going to be looking at physical theories from the perspective of uh, the process theory framework in which you take physical theory and you model it as a symmetric minority category. That means that the, the fundamental structure of your theory is that you have some kind of systems, you have processes that act between the systems, and you have two notions of composition of these systems. These systems can be put together in sequence, or they can be put next to each other in parallel. So essentially the theories in which the main axiom is you can draw circuit diagrams. So, um, these have kind of given an, uh, a separate perspective uh, on quantum foundations, and also in a kind of two-pronged attack, also provided a, a new kind of convenient diagrammatic language for reasoning with quantum processes. So that's our basic toolbox. Uh, and now for the higher order bit. So the thing we want to, to model um, is essentially the notion of a supermap, and the classic example is the notion of a quantum supermap. So a quantum supermap is a transformation on the space of processes in quantum theory. So I take some quantum processor, some quantum process, uh, typically some kind of completely positive trace preserving map, and a supermap will be something that I can apply to that kind of map um, to get a new quantum process. So talking about the kind of transformation of the processes gives you a framework for studying protocols in which channels themselves are treated as resources, or even the supermaps themselves are treated as resources. And they also provide a framework in which you can start talking about things like quantum causal structures. So you can start talking about using uh, qubits, using quantum controls to decide the ordering of parties, to decide how different boxes, the order in which different boxes are going to be rooted together. Great. So that's the kind of thing we want to model. Um, there's an extra thing we want to model, which is uh, once you've started talking about the transformations you can do to processes, um, why stop there? Why not start thinking about the transformations you can do to those transformations of processes and et cetera. So once you've thought about uh, supermaps, you start thinking about super supermaps, et cetera, and you don't stop thinking. <laughs> so these are kind of, uh, we, we call these kind of unified theories of of, of higher order transformations. Um, and there's already a really nice piece of work uh, on putting together kind of a, a process theory perspective um, and the notion of a unified higher order theory in which from any sufficiently well-behaved uh, raw material process theory, uh, the notion of a higher order causal category can be constructed. Uh, so the reference to that is here. Um, 
And in this higher order category, you have analogs of things like the deterministic quantum processes, but also analogs of things like the transformations that preserve the deterministic quantum processes and the even higher order um, kind of iterations of those motions as well. So this cause C, this higher order causal category, um, has a couple of properties. One of them is, is being closed monoidal and a kind of additional extra uh, property that it has above that is a notion of being star autonomous. And it's this property of being closed monoidal that essentially means you, you, you have the structure of these transformations of lower and higher order types. Great. So what do we want to add? Uh, oh, and sorry, yeah. And these kinds of notions are also the notions that are used in developing quantum generalizations of higher order, of languages of higher order computation. So things like quantum lambda calculus. So what do we want to add to a story? Well, one of the nice stories of categorical quantum theory or the process theory approach is the story of starting with a physical theory, uh, the abstract notion, and then learning about quantum theory by adjoining some extra physical conditions. So adjoining some kind of abstract notion of having entangled states, some notion of being causal, or adjoining or, or looking at the kind of uh, a result of, of restricting the complexity of the, the group of phases, phases in your theory. So we want to kind of take that route to thinking about these higher order theories. So we want to start by stating our basic notion of a higher order physical theory and then see what we can learn about these higher order quantum theories, for example, by adjoining physical principles from there. So we did some previous work, which should be on the archive soon in this direction. Um, we started by giving what we claim would be a notion of a theory B, which is a theory of supermaps, these notions. Um, and oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, and we gave a, a separate notion um, using this kind of point in one. We then gave a kind of an additional notion of a unified higher order theory, which turned out to be equivalent to this notion of a closed monoidal category. So before we um, say the new stuff, let's just give a summary of points one and three in this previous work. So we start off with a theory of processes D, which has systems and the maps between them. And then we have another theory of supermaps V. And in the theory of supermaps, uh, the processes between A and B here should appear as states so that they are completely available to be transformed and there appear a state from a new system type that represents the processes from A to B in the original theory C. So that's that's kind of a very basic notion. And once you have this notion of a state that represents a process but in another theory, you can ask about the kinds of transformations that you should be able to do. So we say, okay, in any... Right. Hey, you were breaking up a little, so I didn't get what the A, B was on the right. Oh, yeah, 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 sure. So this A, B is a system type in the higher order theory and the super theory uh, that represents the space of processes from A to B in the lower normal theory C. Okay, got it. Great, thanks. Yeah, just stop me if there's any more breaking up. So once we got this notion, we can say, okay, what supermaps should always exist? Well, there are some very basic supermaps you can think of. If I, if I hand you two processes, possibly correlated, um, surely you should be able to take them and just plug them together. So there should be a supermap that just takes two processes and performs their sequential composition. Uh, the second kind of process we ask for is a notion of taking two processes and just putting them next to each other in parallel. Now, essentially, if you try and write all of this down formally, we ended up discovering that what we were writing down was essentially the notion of a V-symmetric monoidal category C. That is a category or a symmetric monoidal category C whose symmetric monoidal structure, that is the sequential and parallel compositions, are enriched, that is they exist in some other category B. So this turns out to already be a, a well-defined concept. Uh, so this is nice news for us. Uh, 
in our notion of a theory of supermaps, we include one extra condition, which I'll give an intuition for a bit later. Um, and once we have these notion, this notion of a theory of supermaps for another theory, uh, then we can start talking about these unified theories. So a unified theory would be one in which a theory is its own theory of supermaps. So immediately you get all these iterations. So we take V to V equal to C. And if we take one of these unified theories and we also ask for an equivalence uh, between the objects and the space of states on those objects. So we essentially ask that the only purpose of an object is to encode its states. And um, this gives a notion of kind of linking between the levels of the theory. Well, if you have both of these conditions, uh, you do get precisely one of these closed monomial categories, which I haven't, I haven't stated what one is yet. Um, but this is, uh, this is the kind of product we end up with. So this is one way of motivating starting with closed monomial categories. Um, so what's new? Well, the main thing we wanted to do in this paper was now, now we've got this place to start, explore the consequences of adding some, some basic physical conditions and see if we can emulate some of the features of higher order causal categories from kind of core principles. Um, firstly, though, um, we also wanted to try and provide uh, a very kind of simple set of axioms for these higher order process theories, um, which essentially rely on the same principles we've already said. Um, but are kind of easy to state. We, we don't end up using any categorical language um, and uh, hopefully kind of more simple to follow. So we can do this if we choose to bypass this in the intermediate notion of a theory of supermaps and just talk about a unified theory from the start. So now we're going to go right back to the start and give four simple axioms for a unified theory of higher order processes. Uh, first of all, for every pair of objects in our theory, there should be an object that represents the space of processes from A to B in that theory. And there should be some kind of, so these axioms are going to look pretty similar to the notion of a closed minority category anyway, to anyone who's familiar with that. So there will be a notion of a implementation box, which essentially takes a process from A to B and applies it to its claimed input A to produce some output B. And the sense in which this thing works is that for every process from A to B, uh, we ask that there be a static representation of that process, which when plugged into the implementation box, that is usually called an evaluation, will indeed give us back our original processor. So it's a box that we can slot those static processes into. So the second condition, which again will look familiar, um, is that if we have any two uh, processes which have these static processes for outputs, so they produce these processes that are waiting to be used at a later stage, we ask that essentially implementing the processes that they claim to produce uh, does it preserves any distinction between the processes. That is, if these higher order maps are different, then merely implementing their outputs should keep them being different. It should be in some sense faithful. So this is the condition that I didn't mention properly before for super monoidal categories. Um, so the third condition is actually in terms of these implementation boxes, we can define these notions as parallel and uh, sequential composition morphisms again, or processes. And finally, we can again, in terms of this implementation box, give a notion of an object which is equivalent to uh, the space of states on that object. So we ask for each box of the following form to be an isomorphism. Again, if you ask for these four conditions, it turns out that you do get exactly one of these convenient closed monoidal categories. So, which, is, which was the sigma that was in a... Uh, my apologies. This should be... I'm not sure what, what notation I gave before, but it's the analog of this sequential composition morphism here. Ah, oh, right, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, just a, a relic of an old notation. Um, great. So a closed symmetric minoidal category, I should say what one is, is essentially one 
in which not only do you have a static version of every process, but you have a kind of partially static version of every process. That is, if, if the process has two inputs um, and an output, then there will be a version of this process in the theory which takes this input C and produces the remainder as a kind of static process waiting to be used at a later date. So this is occurring. And the reason that the previous axioms lead you towards pairing uh, is essentially that the processes that we just introduced uh, allow you to construct the curried version of any process. So that's where we're going to start. And we've said that we now just want to start with a closed minority category. Um, just a couple of comments uh, in this framework then. There's a clear distinction between these static processes which are waiting to be transformed or used or implemented and there are these dynamic processes. So the kinds of things that you write with inputs and outputs across the page are not the kind of things that you can completely transform. In this framework, there's no sense in transforming something like this. There's only sense in applying some transformation to its output. So they really are different things. Okay, so um, <laughs> in a sense, an immediate <laughs> corollary of, of giving all these axioms and saying, this is what a higher order theory is gonna be, you immediately have uh, a notion of kind, like all of these immediately exist in the theory. So imagine writing down uh, your favorite uh, circuit with a hole in it. You can just replace this hole with one of these implementations or evaluations, which takes a process as a static input and puts it into the cone. Now this picture is not quite the normal notion of cone that gets written down because the output of it is, is, is actually kind of happening along the page. Um, the kind, I think the kind of kind that usually gets written down is a fully static one that just takes some static process and applies some pre and post processing to make a new static process. Um, so the kind of distinction between the two here. So now we've got the toolbox, we finally want to start trying to use it. And the way that we want to try and use it is to go back to the results, uh, three nice results on higher order calls of categories. And see how they look in, in this kind of very abstract approach to modeling the same kinds of things. So a really nice result is that uh, the bipartite process types where these types A, A prime, B, B prime, et cetera, are suitably well behaved. Um, these bipartite process types uh, always represent non-signaling channels. Now, in the language that we've been talking, this representing a non-signaling channel is essentially asking that what happens when you implement all of its outputs is that the, the box that you get as a result is a non-signaling channel. So the theorem says this. Um, if you discard one of the outputs, it pulls through. So, so this result follows from, from viewing these higher order calls of categories as simple kind of theories of higher order processes. Um, and let's just see how that works. So the principles that you need are just determinism. You just ask that your theory only have one, one number and that number should be one, so there's no probabilities. Um, you ask that if a system only has one state, then I shouldn't be able to correlate myself with it. Um, I can only kind of make a separable state with it. And you ask that all your systems are well pointed. And if you ask for all of these, uh, then you get a non-signaling channel immediately. Um, good. So um, we wanted to take a look and see if uh, there are any other notions of no signaling we could look at that maybe you did need this separate property of star autonomy of higher order calls of categories for. And it turns out there is. Um, so there's a notion, there's a notion you can come up with if I take one of these bipartite states, I can say what happens when I try and throw away a process type? There might be lots of effects on the space of processes. Um, can the choice of effect I make signal to the remaining outputs of some joint state? Um, so for any pair of effects I choose, do I always get the same reduced state when I apply them? Turns out that in the presence of star autonomy, the answer is you always get the same state. So you can't signal back in time by getting rid of channel types. Um, so just to state that properly here, if I take all the properties that I was asking for before, and I ask for a notion of star autonomy, 
then I get this additional stronger version of the non signaling theorem. Um, great, so I think I'm pretty much, yeah, okay, so it looks like I'm pretty much out of time, so I'll just summarize. Um, minutes still. Sorry, what's that? You could have up to five minutes. I have, I have a summary, so that's okay. <laughs> Cheers. Um, so, uh, what's the story? Uh, we found we think there are some lessons that you can learn by thinking about these abstract notions of higher order theories. Um, we gave two essentially the same routes, in a sense, to motivating closed minimal categories as a starting point if what you want to model is one of these unified theories. Um, we showed that the, uh, the string diagram toolbox that you get as a result. Um, gives you some intuitive pictures for, for some standard concepts. I didn't mention these bits in the end, um, but we mentioned the combs. Um, and we showed that this, the toolbox is suitable and useful for exploring the relationship between some very basic notions. I should mention that the, 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 the proof steps for proving the first non signaling theorem are, are really essentially the same steps that are used in the original paper on higher order causal categories. Um, so what's next? I think there's all sorts of stuff to be done. Um, I'm going to kind of continue this story of adding principles to these higher order theories. Um, not that you necessarily need this framework to do this first point, to be honest, um, but I think it would be interesting to look at the relationship between things like phase group structures and indefinite causal structures, maybe. Um, this framework in particular, it would be nice to match it up with kind of operational notions of theories, things like generalized probabilistic theories. Um, you've got like a nice formal setting for defining resource theories as higher order processes. Um, the definitions of causal inferential theories have a couple of similar looking equations in them, so it'd be nice to pin down what the exact relationship between the two uh, kind of frameworks are. Um, and um, I don't see any reason why these non-signaling results wouldn't generalize to these more primitive separate supermap and lower order theories. Uh, so maybe generalizing those results to those would be a nice thing to hash out as well. So thanks for listening. And uh, yeah, I'd really like to answer any questions. So yeah, thanks very much again. <laughs>